I'm very happy to sit on the couch on a Sunday, you know, from the 1 p.m. games all the way into the night games and never and never move. Um, I love I really just love the game of football. But I would say I I love covering golf, yeah. you know, just so much. Like, I, I think I'm coming from such a different place because I wasn't a huge fan of watching golf growing up. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So I learned to love this sport in a very different way when I was kind of thrown in as the in-house reporter for the PGA tour in 2011. Yeah. And I just thought it was like a stopover and it ends up being a part of my life. Now I, I could never imagine not having. Thanks so much for joining us. Where are you? Oh, of course. In Jacksonville, I'm doing the uh, Colts Jags game this weekend. Colts. Jags game, man, you're all you're... battle for the AFC South. There you go. You're all over the yeah. place. You're everywhere. I know. I know. What is it? Everywhere like? but home. Yeah. Where? So home is in is San Diego. San Diego. Okay. Mm-hmm. What is life like on the road with this crazy schedule that you keep? It's busy. It is busy. <laughs> I mean, it. It's busy. It's you know. It's you find like your own routine, right? So you kind of forget how abnormal it is. Yeah, I think after a little bit. Um, but yeah, like weird things like I got some new furniture and I'm not home for it to be delivered. So I have 18 friends helping me to like put my house together. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Stuff like that, that. You're like, OK, this I'm pretty sure this isn't normal. But, um, you know, you get to see the whole world. It's wonderful. You do get to see the whole world. So you're on your NFL schedule now. Are you so you're working every week? Um, so I, I actually stopped down. I've been, I've done the last four weeks and then I will stop down next week, go to Australia for the Asian amateur. Um, and then my mom always comes with me. So that's like one of the fun things, you know, I always try to actually explore the places I get to go a little bit. So we'll go to Sydney first and then the tournaments at Royal Melbourne, and then we'll end it, um, in New Zealand and then fly home. So then I'll start back up week 10 for NFL. Oh, that's pretty fantastic. Rural Melbourne. Mm-hmm. That'll be awesome. I'm so excited. That yeah. is really exciting. Well, good for you. I mean, I'm a little, honestly, Amanda, a little intimidated having one of the great sports interviewers. Oh, my gosh. Having to ask you questions. Nice. <laughs> so I thought I, I should take advantage of this opportunity and ask you, okay, as a, as a true pro, what yeah. should I ask you? <laughs> Oh man, that's a tough question. I don't know what uh what route do you want to go down? You tell there's, me. There's plenty. There's a ton of rabbit holes over here. So you whatever rabbit hole. Well, I've got a list <laughs> of questions to to try and find a couple. But um, I mean, you're always on the spot, having to come up with questions to ask coaches or players or yeah. you know uh, what's that process like? I mean, I feel like what I try to do is understand like the theme for that player or team or coach, right? So Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily always come in with like a scripted question. Maybe the first one's a little bit more scripted so we can kind of get right to the point. Um, But usually I have no idea where we're gonna go in the second question because I really wanna be open to whatever that player or coach tells me, right? So I think if you like lock in and you already know, if you've already predetermined where the interview is gonna go, it's it's not going to feel like an authentic conversation where you can get a lot out of that person. So right. um, I try just to be really well researched and understand the person that I'm talking to so that off the cuff, I can say, okay, he answered this. Let's see how that ties into something else that I read about earlier this week or earlier this season or even earlier in their career. Well, good. Yeah. That Okay. I'm throwing away my notes here. I'm going to do that. Yeah, there we go. We're, we're Throw just, them out. <laughs> they're gone. Uh, so that research, I mean, do you have to be plugged in constantly to, I mean, how much time in your job, uh, you know, we see you for a few minutes here and there, but how much time goes into all that research? A lot. It's a totally different type of research from golf to football, right? Yeah. Like I, I always use this example. Um, the Houston Texans have changed coaches and pretty much their entire rosters every single year for the last, you know, four, four or five years. And so, the prep I would do for a Houston Texans game is very different than a tournament, you know, that I go to every year and we pretty much know what to expect from the field and are already pretty comfortable with those players. Right. We kind of already have that inner Rolodex of understanding the history and the context for certain players and what's Mm -hmm. going on with them leading into that week. 
So for golf, it's more of just constantly staying um, interested and engaged every week. So you can kind of like continue to build. Whereas the NFL is like, okay, I did a game last week, throw those 20 pages of notes and that, you know, 20 hours of studying, throw it away, yeah. start fresh the next week. Um, so it's, it, they're two very different types of preparation, but um, it always comes down to as much, as much over preparation, I think, as you can pretty much handle. Yeah, for sure. The more prepared you are, the more spontaneous you can be for sure. Always. Yeah. NFL versus PGA. So, I mean, obviously very different. Um, yeah. What, what, well, which is your preference? You know, I would say I'm inherently um, more of a football fan. You know, yeah. I'm born in Pittsburgh, and uh, those are some of my youngest memories. That's that was the first sport I fell in love with. So I think I'm 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 very happy to sit on the couch on a Sunday. You know, from the 1 p.m. games all the way into the night games, and never and never move. Um, I love. I really just love the game of football. But I would say I I love covering golf. Yeah. You know, just so much. Like, I, th I think I'm coming from such a different place because I wasn't a huge fan of watching golf growing up. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So I learned to love this sport in a very different way when I was kind of thrown in as the in-house reporter for the PGA Tour in 2011. Yeah. And I just thought it was like a stopover. And it ends up being a part of my life now I, I could never imagine not having. So, um, you know, you have one where I, I grew up watching it it being very much a part of my life and my family and my community um, to another sport that I really um, wasn't sure what I was going to be doing with it. Kind of saw it as a stepping stone into the professional world of sports and, and hopefully moving back into football and end up just totally falling in love with it and the stories that we can tell and the beauty and the connection uh, that it brings to us. So what was that journey like, that education? Was it a crash course? I mean, you get a job doing the PGA Tour and suddenly um, you have to know everything about golf and, and all the yeah. people who are playing it. And I'm, I'm I mean, you, you have to be ready to talk to people whose names, even as a hardcore golfer, I don't even know. So, uh, so what was that experience like? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, well, first of all, huge credit to the folks at the PGA Tour because I was very transparent with them when I came in for my audition that I didn't know anything about the PGA Tour. I could name Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson, and Jim Furyk because Jim Furyk went to the same high school that I did uh, mm -hmm. in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So um, I think that was probably the best thing I could have done for myself was come in really open and honest with them uh, mm -hmm. so that there, I didn't have to feel like I had to fake it at all. And I think in being honest, I was way more protected early on, which is what I needed to be as I was learning the game. Because as you know, I think golf compared to any other sport has so many nuances um, the, from the verbiage to the history to um, the, you know, the way that you speak about it. Right. I remember trying to call highlights for the very first time and Billy Kratzer was in the studio with me and it's something so stupid, right. But you would never know it that you don't call uh, you know, your first shot on a par three, you don't call that a drive. It's your tee shot because clearly you're not using a driver, right? So like there were certain things that you just don't know until you make the mistake, um, you know, or a hole out or a chip in, you can't, you can't call it a chip out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like there, right. there were just, there were so many fundamental things I had to learn about how you talk about the game and I, I've said this in the past, and it's, it's crazy to think about now, but I actually use Twitter as the place I would live tweet the golf tournaments while I was in the office watching it for work because I felt like that was the best way for me to learn how to speak about it because at that time, golf Twitter was a safe space. I could make yeah. mistakes on golf Twitter, and they were so nice to me and would help me understand how I would actually say that better. Or if I misspelled Jeff Ogilvy's name, right? It yeah. was like, hey, Amanda, actually, it's G-E-O-F-F. -F. Like, not what I would get now. So um, yeah. I use that platform as a really safe space to learn how to talk about it in live, you know, in live time. Um, but yeah, there, it was a huge learning curve. And I was eating, sleeping, and drinking golf and only golf for, for a lot of years there. Yeah, golf has so many sort of um, secret handshakes and... 
yeah. inside info to put it. and and, and yeah. just and that's and it's it's tough for I mean I can imagine as a beginning announcer but even as a beginning player there's it, there's so many things that I wonder like how new players coming into the game um, just understand all of golf's sort of unwritten rules and its verbiage and and all those things but um, you've become... well, I don't think they do right I mean I can't tell you right. how many women I talk to who want to get into the game and they're and I mean we've all heard it right mm -hmm. it's intimidating I'm scared I don't know where to go I don't know how to start um and and you're right it's like those secret handshakes uh, sometimes I think the golf world almost feels proud of building these fences um and then at the same time wonders why more people don't want you know to get yeah. started um and it's it's a it's a difficult thing but I think you know public courses and and like full swing on Netflix like I think all these things that are creating more access points are making it feel more accessible as a fan and, and as a beginner player as well, which is helpful. Do you feel as an, you know, uh, doing interviews, do you feel any responsibility to speak to that sort of casual fan or someone who doesn't know golf as you're doing these interviews? Um, it's pro probably good that you come from a place that isn't too golfy uh so that yeah. you're speaking to people in you know in in english instead of sort of golf ease it's funny i say this all the time like when i was hired at cbs i understood very quickly that i was never going to know more about golf than jim nance or right. ian baker finch or frank Nobler or dotty pepper right like that or or know as much about teaching as mark immelman like that's just not my lane my lane is to bring the human interest side or the conversational side of a fan to the viewer at home. And that viewer is my mom, right? Mm -hmm. And like the late, and her, and her entire community are my friends who are, you know, casual golfers and just sports fans and are gonna turn on the TV. Like my job is not to talk the X's and O's. And quite frankly, I don't think a whole lot of viewers would want to hear that from me anyway. Like I always, say, you know, our broadcast is maybe three hours long, you're hearing those X's, X's and O's for pretty much two hours and 45 minutes of it, right? Yeah. So by the time these guys get to me, we're, we're done with that. Now we're trying to get into how this player got there in a more, you know, on a deeper level, right? On an emotional, mental, you know, physical, what, what's been going on there. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to get into that. And then we're also trying to get you to care about these guys, right? If, if it's a player you've never heard about, no offense, but if we're talking about, you know, your, your lie angle, or like we're talking about your, your, your swing path, like no one is going to walk away being like, wow, I really want to cheer for that guy. Like th that's sure. just not what's going to happen, right? The goal is to have them walk away saying, oh man, I didn't know he and I had that in common or oh, I didn't know that that guy has a really great sense of humor. I want to go follow them on Twitter. And now I'm going to be more interested next time I see them on air. Um, you know what I mean? So I think uh, that's my goal. I, I think if we can do that in the very little amount of time we have, then I've, I've done my job. Now in doing your job and that's, yeah, that's exactly what, you know, we need in a broadcast and doing that job, you bring a ton of energy. And I think people really respond to your positivity, your energy levels. Um, is that natural for you? Or do you have to work at it? Are you a, are you an extroverted person? Um, I'm or or, or I'm does pretty it take charismatic. <laughs> I would say I'm pretty like this all the time. <laughs> that's, got, that's what I'm wondering. Um, you know, I won. <laughs> I th I love my job, right? Like yeah. I get to just talk about sports, and I. Yeah, I mean, I think it does. It excites me. And that's the thing. Like, I'm just as excited to talk to a player that no one has ever heard of yet mm -hmm. as I am to talk to Tiger Woods, right? Like, I actually think it's more interesting for us to be able to bring someone to the forefront for the very first time and get to share that story because every single athlete has a story and has a different switch in them that has allowed them to reach this 1% of the 1%, right? It's just yeah. getting to the core of that and, and translating it in a way that, that make people care. Um, but yeah, I think I, I'm very cognizant of the fact that sports are supposed to be an outlet. Um, we are supposed to be a distraction from the terrible real world things that are happening, not only in our world, but also um, you know in people's personal lives. And it's not life or death, you know? So I really try to say that like, I can ask a hard question without being a jerk. 
right? I can also mm -hmm. ask a hard question. I can ask Scotty Scheffler about him struggling with his putting and not make it seem like it's the saddest, most brutal thing on the planet because it's not. <laughs> Scotty yeah. Scheffler's just fine. You know what I'm saying? It's like, we're allowed to talk about these things within the framework of what sports are really supposed to be about and why we all fell in love with it in the first place. Um, so I feel like that's the place I'm always coming from. And um, I do think that resonates with people that like, who, it doesn't need to be that serious all the time, right? And, and yeah. are there serious stories? Of course there are. Like, I'll never forget having to interview Tiger Woods right after Kobe Bryant died, right? Like that's a serious world, real world thing that crossed over into our sport. Um, you know, and, and obviously there, there's a number of examples of that, but I'm saying just for our regular interviews with guys struggling or fighting for their cards, like that's supposed to be the fun stuff that we're able to pull out that provides inspiration or motivation or some level of interest um, to the viewer at home without making it seem like it's the most important thing in the world. Tell us about the Tiger interview. How did you prepare for that? What were your feelings going into that and um, your concerns about how to handle something like that? That was a surreal, that was one of those terrible days you, you hope to never repeat ever again. Um, we were about 15 minutes before, I think 15 minutes before we were about to go live on air um, is when the news started to break that Kobe Bryant had been killed in this, in this crash. And one, right, it's such a shocking thing to read that nobody believed it. Nobody wanted to believe it, I think, for a while, right? I think TMZ, I think they were the ones who broke it. They're usually pretty credible, but you don't, you just want to wait, right? You want to wait mm -hmm. for that confirmation. And as we're getting this confirmation, we're also trying to figure out how to get on air for the first time in the year, right? This is happening at Torrey Pines. The first time we come back on air on the West Coast swing after taking a considerable of time off for football. So there's like a whole lot going on. And then there's the question of, um, you know, does Tiger know, you know, throughout that round, remember he was in, I think, I mean, he was in the mix, I want to say, I mean, we were, we were showing him a lot and there was this constant question of, does he know what's going on? We all knew how much he looked up to Kobe. We all knew that they had some sort of relationship. Um, and then the way I handled that was, you know, listen, you want to be respectful. I, I still don't know how close they were, right? But mm. it, it, this is someone who's going to be learning of a really traumatic death. And you don't know what that emotional response is going to be. Uh, so we went through the PJ tour communications and I said, you know, CBS is requesting tiger. It will be just two questions and we will only be talking about the passing of Kobe and what Kobe meant to tiger. That's it. Um, and that really was tiger's choice then to say, yes, I will come over and speak to this. And I do think the sports world needed to hear from him. Um, I think everyone was kind of looking for someone who could maybe understand the level of fame that Kobe reached and, and who else could really speak to that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the life he lived and the things that he had gone through more than Tiger Woods. Um, and I think at the time Tiger agreed to do it. He signed some autographs uh, beforehand, which is not the usual order of events, but I think probably just to get his head right and, and really think about the way that he wanted to speak on this. And, you know, I think the two questions they were as compassionate as I could make them. And I think that was always the, the goal. The goal is not to treat this as a news story. The goal is to treat this as a horrific loss of life and talking to someone who was also impacted by this loss of life and how they can possibly maybe make something that doesn't make sense, make people soothe people for lack of a better term. You know what I mean? I think everyone was yeah. kind of looking for some comfort in this time and maybe hearing from someone like Tiger Woods could, could provide that in some way. So um, I think, I think the first question was just about my relationship or his relationship with him. Um, and I think the second question had to do with Kobe as, you know, he and Joey LaCava had spoken a lot over the years about Kobe, about the Lakers, right? In their conversations as, as caddy and player. And uh, that was my second question. You know, you've, this is a guy who has been a topic of conversation for you on the golf course many times. Um, you know, what, what kind of motivation or, you know, inspiration did you draw from him as a father and as a player? And I kind of let him choose what route he wanted to go down, right? Like if you don't want to talk, if, it, if it's too personal and it's too soon to talk about, 
him as a father and understanding he just left these this beautiful family behind, then go and, and take it as what he meant to you as an athlete. And that's what he chose to do. And I feel like that was the right thing to do is not corner him into um, an uncomfortable, really personal conversation. Always give the person that you're talking to um, that compassion that everyone deserves. And um, that's how we handled it. And, you know, I, I, I think we did that the, the very best that we could in that moment. Yeah. What tough moment. I mean, would it, would that be, you know, looking on your back on your career and your many interviews, um, what have, would have been the really tough moments? Yeah. I mean, I would say that, uh, that was probably the toughest in understanding the magnitude, right? Yeah. Not, I mean, it's hard to let that magnitude sink, sink in when that's happening live, but I mean, everyone understood that this was something that, you know, the sports world, no one, no one was prepared for this. So yeah, I think that was definitely up there. Um, I remember when Nate Lashley won for the first time, that was a tough one. Um, you know, obviously God, he's been through more than anyone should ever have to go through, right. Losing his parents and girlfriend and, and that, and that plane crash, um, and having his sister there, you know, when he won for the first time and seeing how emotional she was, and knowing that what else could he be thinking about in that moment, aside from wishing his parents who got him to this place, yeah. you know, wishing that they could see this now. Um, I get kind of emotional still talking about it. I think I had pretty recently lost my dad right around that time. So like, that was one of those just like human things where like, I I was sobbing, yeah. <laughs> I think before I went out there, because I, I understood what that was like to miss, to miss a parent in the happy moments, right? That's a part of grief that no one really talks about. And feeling like, man, I, I do, I think I understand more than most, maybe what he's feeling, but also recognizing that's not my role to re-trigger his trauma so mm. we can get a great quote. You know what I mean? I think that's yeah. always something that's at the top of my mind. Wyndham Clark, very similar, right? Lost his mom when he wins. Um, I, tried to, I tried to ask him a question in a way that if he chose to bring up his mom, he could make that choice to do it. But I really am sensitive in re-trauma and making people relive their trauma just for a great moment on TV. I just think as the worst thing you could possibly do as a human being in our industry, um, but giving people the platform to talk about it if they want to. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that Nate Lashley one was was pretty tough. I'm sure there, I'm sure there have been other ones that, you know, it was a weird one was, um, we always try to stay away from those gotcha moments, right? So like, if I have to ask a player a tough question, I'm gonna ask the question, but I do let them know ahead of time, hey, I, I need to ask you about this, right? Patrick Reed, that one kind of sticks out um, with the whole cheating, did he cheat scandal at, uh, at Torrey Pines. Right. And he knew before he we went on camera, oh, so I'm gonna ask you about this, right? It gives them a little bit of time and it doesn't feel like I, uh, and I gotcha moment, and it doesn't destroy trust between us and, and the player. And we did not have time to do that um, when John Rom won at Memorial and everyone thought and, and his ball moved, remember? Right, and he was right. assessed that penalty, but no one had the chance to tell him or ask him about it before we got to our live interview because we're within the, the, the time frame, right? Of our broadcast window. We don't have time to wait a couple extra minutes, right? If we're diving off air at 6 p.m. Eastern time, that's the time we have to get off air. So um, I remember them telling me in my ear, like, hey, you, you gotta ask him about this. And there was no time for me to tell him before we went live. And yeah. oh, that I, and you know what? And guess what? It created that 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 gif that we still see today, right? Like that's the type of stuff. I'm like, man, I hate that I did not have the moment <laughs> to tell him. And, you know, and afterwards, you know, the next week, next time I saw him, I pulled him aside and and I apologized. I said I, I didn't intend for that to happen that way, and kind of explained to him why it did. Um, and you just hope that they trust that you're not there to, to get them, right? You're yeah. there to ask them really fair questions, but you're not there to make them look like total idiots um, for the betterment of your own career. Well, that's a credit to you, Amanda, because I think a lot of the content we consume comes from folks who would try and grab at some emotional, uh, at some heartstring or something emotional or force someone into talking about something that will be... Uh, that will become a gif or will become yeah. viral, you know? So, um, yeah. it's nice to, it, you know, that you're so thoughtful about that. Uh, I know I'm sure that the players appreciate it, um, on the side of the players that you, 
you know, that ha- moments that haven't been so tough? What have been the really fun interviews or, or the people that as they're walking up to your interview spot um, that you're really excited to see them? Man, Michael Block, PGA Championship yeah. uh, this past year was – that was a very cool one to do. I think mainly because I was really proud of myself that I had uh, gotten in, in touch with his son and they sent us all that footage from the viewing party and everyone going out of their minds, oh, yeah. you know, with the hole in one and yeah. his son's texting me how proud he is of his dad. And I'm like, this, this literally is, this couldn't be any better, right? Like it was just like everything you could have dreamed about on how to put a bow on the Cinderella story. Um, and he came in and I was like, I'm about to make you cry. <laughs> and he was like, oh no, what's going to happen? I think he had already cried the day before or something else. Um, and we did that. It was just one of those unbelievable underdog stories that, you know what, I, it just felt like the everyday guy got a win. And what is better than that in sports, right? It's like, yeah. you think about how many movies are, are made around that concept and we got to see it happen in real time, in real life, at a freaking major championship. Um, that was that was a really cool one to be able um, to do and hopefully add to his joy in that moment, right? To hear from his son and see his home club pretty much live for him. Yeah. That was really cool. Um, the Dustin Johnson interview was awesome, you know, when he won in the November Masters. And that was right. such a unique time because... I mean, we'll never again probably have that extra buffer that we needed to fill because it was college football, right? So it like kind of shifted our our schedule. And that's the reason why after he left Butler Cabin, we were able to get that one extra interview with him after. And I'll be honest, I had no idea how that was going to work. I'm like, Jim freaking Nance just interviewed him. What more can I add to this? (laughs) You know what I mean? And, (laughs) And sometimes what we... And what we kind of like happened upon was what we were able to add was him having the time to let it soak in. You know what I mean? Like that's all he needed. He just needed some time and some quiet to walk out on that green and see his brother and his wife to the right and be standing there with his green jacket on and hundreds of photographers in front of him in silence for 30 seconds. And I'm telling you, like that moment, let it sink in for him what he just accomplished. So me being able to ask him about being a little kid growing up and every single putt when he was little was to win the Masters and now he's actually done it. I think it was just like the perfect combination of like, boom, it's it's setting yeah. in what he just did. That one was really, really fun. How great is it to cover the Masters? Uh, I mean, I I get to we get to go down or, or I've been there a few times, but to really be inside a Masters tournament like that, I mean, that's just got to be... I mean, it's interesting though. You didn't grow up in golf, so you weren't practicing on the putting green for every putt uh, to not. win the Masters. <laughs> um, but it, it doesn't take long for you to sort of, you know, once you're on the property, to understand the just the magnitude of the whole thing. Um, yeah. 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 What What are your? You've gotten to do a lot of great events. Is where do you rank the Masters and other the, uh, the other top events you've done? What are your favorites? Oh, I mean, it's, it's one and one a, right. It's just an, it's an honor to be a part of that broadcast team. There are not a whole lot of, there are not a whole lot of announcers who are able to say that they worked, you know, the main broadcast for the masters. Like it's just, it's a small group to be able to join. And it's a very cool thing to be trusted with that. Um, obviously that is, um, I mean, it's the most special week of the entire year, right? And mm-hmm. and to be trusted to take care of that and and foster it and turn it in and, and keep it, you know, so special. I think that's that is like what makes it feel like it's it's such an honor. But I mean, even though I didn't grow up, what that's like the great thing about the Masters, right? It transcends golf. Every sports fan ha- is watching the Masters, whether they care about golf or not, right? Like that's the yeah. beauty of of that um of that tournament and i remember when i got the phone call from sean mcmanus that i was going to get the nod to work the masters and i was at home i think he i think he might have called me it was around the holidays because i was home with my parents and to be able to share that news with them like we already thought i had the dream job right with no expectation that i would work on the main masters 
you know, announce team. Um, and then I get this call from the, the president and chair of, of, of CBS Sports. And he says, Amanda, you know, you're going to be joining us in April, you know, at Augusta National. Wow. And to be able to hang up my phone and share that news with my mom and dad was like the proudest moment of my <laughs> life, probably. Oh my you know what I mean? Like that oh, was yeah. like, because my parents grew up, I mean, my parents are golf fanatics, right? So I've always grown up on golf courses. I grew up taking lessons when I was little. It just wasn't something that resonated with me um in terms of like an athlete being an athlete and then uh the sports that i wanted to cover it but it's always been a, a huge part of my life um because my whole family loves it so much so that was one of the cooler things to be able to share with them and, and have my dad actually watch me do my first masters right like oh, i feel like he pretty much got to see me do the things that uh i know made him the most proud which is very cool and uh, i think it's it's never lost on me the privilege of being able to be a part of that broadcast. It never gets old. It never gets less stressful because you want to be so perfect that week, you know, yeah. from start to finish, which is of course impossible in live television. Um, but you are, you, you have a smile on your face from, from start to finish there. It's, it's the best. Do you find yourself at Augusta minding your P's and Q's a little more as, as a broadcaster? I mean, cause there are famous stories of broadcasters saying things that, uh, Augusta National didn't appreciate and didn't go back. Um, is it, is, I, I is it a place where like, you're a little more careful? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just protecting, like I was saying, like how special that week mm -hmm. is and you want to keep it that way, right? Like I want to be a part of, of presenting the Masters in a way that maintains that level of um, the level, the, the standard, right? The standard that they have set and no one else has ever been able to match. And it's, it's a fun challenge, right? To just say, all right, you lock in for one week. It's like our Super Bowl. Like you, you lock in for that one week and you just try to be the absolute best you can, you can be because you want to be a part of holding that integrity um, of, of that tournament so, so desperately. So of course yeah. you do it. And whenever you care about anything, you know what I mean? Especially like you care about, you just care about it so much. So you just want to pour everything you have into it and make sure like, I'm always thinking like, I want to make this the best question I've ever asked in my whole life for every interview. <laughs> it's like, you know, you end up putting so much pressure on yourself um, the whole week, but that's just because you care so much because it, it means so much. Yeah. The word, yeah. So you mentioned growing up in Lancaster. Um, and you know i'm from philadelphia so i could say lancaster instead of lancaster yeah you right? said it just right so yeah. just right uh shout out to <laughs> christian hafer our photographer who lives there now and yep. um He's so where did he you... and his wife are amazing they're great um yeah they're is that where your is that where your parents played at lancaster cc no we were the other the other country club which is ben Creek country club okay ben creek and then there's another one up there with the wagon wheel uh conestoga conestoga yeah so yeah. There's, there's good golf yep. up, out, I should say, out there. I live right off Lancaster Avenue, in fact. In oh, very nice. Yes. Yeah, there's there's some sneaky good golf out there. <laughs> um, yeah, Bent Creek was where I grew up and had all my first golf lessons. And yeah, it was it was the best. It's very cool now to see Lancaster Country Club be put on the map, though, um, you know, with the yeah. LPGA and bringing majors there. It, it's so deserving. And I, it makes my heart so happy when people go and they go as fans and they come back like like is a pretty pretty cool place i'm like i know we're more than just amish you know we're more than just a horse and buggy guys <laughs> yeah it's a very it was a, it was a very fun place to grow up for sure will you get the cover i don't know who does the the women's open it's yeah no i think it's yeah it'll be nbc uh golf channel uh, so well maybe yeah, they'll get an event that you do that'd be such a cool home game for you right oh it Are would be in Lancaster? that'd be wild Yes, it would be really, really fun. I should just see. I don't know where that lines up on our schedule, but I should just go as a fan. That would be the way to do it. Actually. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And then, and then you'll get interviewed again. Um, oh gosh. <laughs> steering so away from golf, Amanda. Tell me about your passions aside. You know, aside from football, golf. What are you passionate about? Yeah, I'm super passionate about yoga. That's okay. a big one for me. I think yoga has through, I mean, that this is not me being dramatic. I think it literally has saved my life. <laughs> really? Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a practice 
it's a practice that it was the first time I ever realized that I had a choice in the way I showed up, right? When things happen, that things don't just happen to me and I just have to react. And you know what I mean? Like I, I remember when I first, I have my 200 hour now and, and yoga, I have my 200 hour yoga certification and Baptiste style. And I was going through a, a pretty rough time personally when I kind of started to get into it. And they would always say this thing, like it's a choice you can choose happiness. It's a choice to be happy every day. And I really wanted to be like, you know what? Like, F you, like, right. you don't know what's going on in my it life. Like, like, how dare you heart. tell me? Yeah. Right. Like, what are we talking about here? Right. And I started to realize through, you know, the, the practice that I um, specialize in is no music, heated room. And it's all about connecting your breath to your movement, to your body, right? Like mind, body, breath connection. That's what it's all about. And it's just repetition of that for, for 90 minutes. And I started to really understand what they were saying and that, you know, terrible things are gonna happen to you, right? Like whether it's your fault or someone else's fault, you can't control these terrible things in life, but you can control how you react and you can control how long it kind of owns you. And like that idea of choosing happiness was, um, went from being so ridiculous to kind of like a mantra for me and like finding one thing I'm happy for a day, right? Finding one thing I'm grateful for a day. And if I can do that, um, you know, during times where it felt like everything was awful, then I am choosing to find the good in life right now, right? It's like that idea of just being able to control what you can control in the way that you the way that you show up in your life, no matter what's happening externally to you was just like one of the most transformational things ever for me. Um, and then of course, now that I travel about 40 weeks a year, it's amazing to be able to just, you know, bring a mat with me or, or go steal one from the gym. I always return it after, you know, before I leave, but, you know, being able to just have a practice in my room without having to worry about like getting my, you know, my, my daily fitness or, you know, health check in. So, um, yoga is a big one for me, uh, dogs. I am obviously massively passionate about dogs. I have a foundation called puppies and golf. Um, and to date we have been able to get over, we've given over $150,000 in grants to this point, um, spread over three different pillars. So our first pillar is to help, uh, shelters and rescues in need that, um, you know, through not only financial grants, but through awareness and helping to promote the dogs that they need to get adopted or ways to be able to help that shelter. And then we provide them with a grant for things that they need. Um, we provide family grants for people. Let's say your dog gets hit by a car and you can't afford those medical bills. We will step in and help help you pay them directly to the vet so that the dog can get the care it needs and stay in a help, you know, in a happy home because a lot of surrenders happen at shelters because people simply can't afford one big medical bill that mm. came in. Um, so we try to prevent the shelter overpopulation in a small way through that. And then our third pillar, um, which actually stemmed from my time here in Jacksonville, Florida, I'm here right now because I'm doing the uh, Jags Colts game this weekend, but I lived here for five years, obviously when I worked for the tour, and I started volunteering at Canines for Warriors, which is one of the most amazing organizations of all time. And they go in and they rescue dogs from high kill shelters, train them to become service animals for our military veterans. And wow. oftentimes military veterans will say the first time that they woke up not thinking about suicide was the first day they woke up with their dog. Mm. And it's like the most beautiful full circle moment ever. So we um, also provide a ton, as much support as we can to organizations that train service animals for our military veterans. So we give a minimum of $30,000 a year to Canines for Warriors. We just partnered with another um, service animal organization called ECAD up in Connecticut. And uh, we hope to continue to grow, grow that more and more. But yeah, I would say that's a big passion for me is just trying to save all the dogs and make people's lives better uh, with yeah. that human dog connection. That is awesome. What a great, yeah, thank uh, you. wow. What in I'm a dog lover here. In fact, the last time I was in Lancaster was to pick up our new dog, and I didn't go to a puppy mill. I, I, okay, that's had, good, because we have a lot of those in Lancaster. You have a lot in Lancaster. <laughs> oh, I know God. you do. We're working on it. We're working on it. I know. <laughs> no, we went to a, a very respected, responsible breeder uh, because okay. we needed a hypoallergenic dog for my wife. So, uh, But we, we were up there, got a beautiful, a, a beautiful puppy. And our so golf course sweet. here, where I'm working in the Catskills, is dog-friendly. 
And I think there Amazing. needs to be more dog friendly golf courses in America. Ireland and Scotland, you see it all the time over here. The home of golf the has always golf. allowed right. dogs. But for some reason, we think we know better than Scotland. Make it make I, sense. It, <laughs> exactly. No, I mean, why, you're going out to walk around for four hours outside and you're going to leave your dog and, you know, an outdoor animal. You're going to leave them inside your home. So let's get more dogs on golf courses. Um, yep, I'm with you there. Pretty amazing. Well, I, th I think you might be a new ambassador for us. Welcome. Welcome to the advisory board of Puppies and Golf. I'm in. I'm 100% I'm <laughs> right, in. I would, awesome. lo I would lo I love what you're doing there. Thank um, you. And that's what you're just going back to what you were saying about yoga. That's just pretty amazing. You know, I think of yoga as just a way that maybe like I can stretch a little bit and maybe loosen up mm. my hips so I can improve my turn or something like that. And Yeah, um, it can be some, that too. It yeah. can be that too, yeah. It's, yeah. So we have our members, subscribers are involved in this index experiment this year, getting better at golf. And I'm sure some of them have turned to yoga as part of their fitness routine uh, to improve. And, and I dabbled with it in the past as well, um, to help my golf game. But, uh, mm -hmm. are there players on tour that, that you suggest yoga to, or that, you know, are doing yoga or part of their, uh, is part of their, yeah, game? I do. I actually, I'm trying to think, I feel like I've had a lot of conversations with players, Jason bone randomly. Um, I remember this conversation a million years ago with him ever. He had a heart attack, right? I think he had a heart attack a number of years ago. Yeah. And one of the first things uh, I did an interview with him. I mean, this is this feels like a million years ago now, but I remember him telling me that yoga became a huge part of his life, and he kind of got it right. Like, yeah. I think a lot of people get into yoga for the the reasons that you're talking. It's great for your spinal flexibility. It's great. Um, it's great to build, you know, that hip mobility for your turn. There's so many great things that translate from yoga to to the golf swing, um, and I think that's why a lot of players start to go. And then what they realize is, wait, there's, there's actually more here, depending on the style that you decide to go with, right? Like if mm -hmm. you're just doing a straight up vinyasa flow, or you're doing like a yin, which is like a really slow stretching class, they're probably not giving you a whole lot of like motivational life lessons to tie in from, from your mat. But like Baptiste style, if anyone out there is looking for like a, a type of style, that's, you know, that's the kind that can really connect you with your mind and your body and your breath um but yeah there's sam Ryder. i think has, has started to do some yoga he and i have talked about that um i think a lot of players really have started to see the benefits and learning how to control your breath in a really hot class when you're frustrated and annoyed because you hate the position so much absolutely trains you on how to maintain your breath on the golf course when you're in a position that you're really annoyed with sure. out on the golf course too. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's, there are a lot of those things that you just learn to control your body in a different way in your mind. Um, but I think, I think a lot, and a lot of players into meditation, right? I mean, that's, sure. that's a big one to help with focus. Um, and those in yoga and meditation obviously go hand in hand. So um, it's, it's very much something that I think players are starting to pay more attention to um, because every player right now is just looking for that edge, whatever that edge is, they're going to be willing to do it. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of NFL players too who are starting to mention that they're doing yoga as well, I think in an effort to minimize their soft tissue injuries, right? Like I think the more flexible and the more limber you are, the less likely you are to suffer, um, you know, a pulled hamstring or, or something like that um, or any of that soft tissue stuff. So um, it's, it's athletes across the board who are seeing the benefits of it for sure. I want to do yoga now, but I'm in, uh, but yeah. I am intimidated going back to like the, the beginning of our conversation. Like I feel like a beginning golfer because I don't know all those words you just mentioned. Um, they yeah. sound, they sound, there's a, there's an expertise there that, um, that I'm very far, far away, far removed from. So, um, as a beginner, like how does someone, what would you recommend to someone who wants to give it a shot? Yeah, I would, I would not try to do it on YouTube videos. People try to do that. And as a teacher, I think it's one of the most dangerous things you can do because alignment, like learning proper alignment so you don't injure yourself is really important, right? Especially if you're going there to kind of strengthen your body and, and you're not quite there yet. Um, yeah. So just Google yoga studios in your area and try to find like a local one, right? If there's all those chains and and those are fine, I think, if you already have a pretty solid practice. But if you can find like a local studio and call them and just say, hey, I'm a beginner. What class do you recommend? They're going to 
they're going to be happy to help you out. So that, that would be my best advice is, is just find a studio nearby, give them a call and they will tell you the exact classes to go. And don't be scared to raise your hand or let the teacher know in the beginning of class, this is my first time or I'm still a beginner. And usually they are so they're, they're very excited to come over and give an assist or, or give you different cues if it feels like it's kind of going too fast. But it's once you start going two weeks, if you can go consistently for two weeks, you're going to feel like a professional yogi. I promise. <laughs> I would love to be a yogi. Um, it just takes reps. And it, yeah. And, you know, of course, so many coaches talk about, or golf coaches, performance folks talk about the importance of controlling your breath. And there's, yeah, and there's just so many good things I think that could, as you mentioned, that could come from it. It's just a matter of got to do it. Um, Getting outside of that comfort zone. Yeah. No, Something it would new. be. Me walking yeah. into a yoga studio would be so far outside of my comfort zone. Um, I love it. But, but I would, like, what do I wear? Do I, do I just like <laughs> honestly i'd roll in there and like um, like like, like yeah. dressed for golf you just wear shorts and a t-shirt okay all right um the uh you've accomplished so much and have done so many cool things we've been talking about them today what goals do you have for yourself are you a goal setter do you have goals ahead of you that you want to achieve um i i don't it's i my goal the goal was to be good enough to get a chance to be an announcer on, on national television for a major network. That was my goal, right? Like that was it since I was in middle school. So it's super interesting when you reach that goal and also reach it in a very unexpected way, right? Like my whole life, I was very myopic in terms of like not thinking I had any other option but to be an NFL sideline reporter. Like I had such a narrow view of the way my life was going to turn out. And I think anyone here probably over the age of 19 can laugh at that and say, yeah, it never works out the way we think it's going to. Right. right. Um, and talk about getting out of your comfort zone, taking that job with the PGA tour was like, so out of my comfort zone and so far away from what I thought I wanted to do. But then in the end of the day, it leads me to the dream and actually a better dream than I could have ever imagined. Right. So it's funny now when I think about, okay, what's next, I try really not to limit myself and like picking specific goals. I think it's more like being open to just being open to whatever comes next, like not keeping myself in this, like in this little box saying, I only do post round interviews, right? Mm -hmm. I only do this sport. I only do that. Like I, I I'm super interested in, in how I can continue like my story. Like I think I naturally, love to be a storyteller and pull stories out of inspirational people, right? Like I think that if I could be like on the 60 minutes, there we go. Maybe that's like 60 minutes. That would okay. be something so cool. Um, you know, just that <laughs> idea of being able to help others share their stories that can impact others um, in, in pretty, in pretty cool ways, I think is my passion. I don't know what that's going to look like in the future, but I think if I know what I love to do, I think that helps me continue just to, you know, go down that road, no matter where it takes me, if that makes sense. I think that's a, a perfect way of looking at it. And yeah. right. Because, you know, even me doing a podcast, right. If I would have said my goal was to publish a book, which it was, uh, yeah. and for, uh, for a number of years. And then that happens. And, um, I, I, I don't think my next goal was to publish three books or four books, it, just the idea of let's see what comes down the pipe and be open to it. Um, yes. It's, and, and it's just fun. And I've got to learn to do all these different things I never thought I'd be doing, like talking, yeah. like talking to Amanda on the Golfer's Journal podcast. So <laughs> thank, I can't thank yeah. you enough for the time you've given us today before I let you go. Um, just, I think as people, I, I think as, as we talked about before, you have a great relatability and charisma on camera. Um, is there anything and, and to, to where I think that people who watch feel like they know you, um, mm. is there, is there anything different between the sort of camera Amanda and the, and the daily Amanda that would, um, or is, are people sort of seeing what they get or is there anything that you would say, well, no, I'm really, I'm really a little more like this. 
No, I mean, I'm pretty I much I'm who, asking who you I am. I, I, this is a weird question. I'm like, are you fake? <laughs> this is what the question No, was. you know, I think it's actually, <laughs> I think not... it's a really fair question because um, I was actually just talking to my therapist about this earlier today. So it's funny <laughs> that you say that. Like, uh, I remember when I interned actually for CBS, there was a CBS 2, uh, the local station in New York. That was the internship where I realized I just loved television and broadcasting. I was a, the morning show intern for them. And I'm not a morning person. So my mom was like, okay, if you're voluntarily getting up at 3 a.m. to take the train into the city to be there by, you know, 5 a.m. and you're staying till like, you're meant to be doing this. And um, one of the great pieces of, of advice that I got at, during my time there was, especially in New York, you have to be yourself. If you try to be anything else, these New Yorkers are going to see right through you and they are going to tear you apart. And I really took that to heart, like, because I think when you're coming up, you're looking at people who you draw inspiration from and you think, OK, that's how I have to be right. Like, I love the way Rachel Nichols presents. Maybe I should try to talk like Rachel Nichols. I love the way Erin Andrews has, you know, her camaraderie with her fellow announcers. Maybe I should try to do that. Well, it doesn't work if it's not you. Right. So um i really felt like if i was going to succeed or i was going to fail i was going to do it on my own terms being myself because that was the only way that i would a be able to keep up with it if i did succeed or and b if i failed and i was never really myself i feel like i would have deep regrets i could never get over um so i, I stayed i and i still to this day stay pretty committed to just being myself um on social on tv i think the only stuff that people don't see is like the hard stuff that I don't think I need to share with people. You know what I mean? I think, sure. I think a lot of times people assume that what they're seeing on social media or, you know, I have a smile on my face every day on camera. Like there could be like, I, like after my dad died, there were many days where I was sobbing in my car, barely able to breathe and had to pull it together, slap some makeup on, put a smile on my face and go do my job. Right. Like that kind of stuff is, is that's not really reality what you're seeing there. Um, that's just having to do your job. But I would say aside from that, that's, I'm, I'm exactly who I am. And I might like to have a couple more beers than people acknowledge, but that might be it. <laughs> that's what I was getting at. It's football I season. To... I don't know what you want. I don't know what you want from me. <laughs> you buried the lead. I was trying to, no, the, the, uh, uh, <laughs> no, be yourself. What better what better advice is there? And I found that uh in my life, you know, trying to be someone you're not um never works, uh, right? It doesn't work and it's exhausting as well. Yes. Right? Yes. I mean, if you're going to be exhausted, <laughs> at least be tired right. being you cuz yeah, yeah. It, it's too much work. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Amanda, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and thank you for everything. I mean, we all look forward to seeing you on the broadcasts and thank you for everything you bring to golf and to making broad oh. golf broadcasts better. So, uh thank big you. thanks. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me.